Okay. So um, those uh, who are online, can you see our screen? Yes, we can. Oh, sure. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, hi, guys. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to join us. Uh, my name is Whitney Henson. I'm the team leader for our Flood Emergency Response Group. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about our translator concept that we are hoping to present soon. So managing an emergency situation can be a complicated and multifaceted task. Now, one of the most important and oftentimes overlooked parts of any highly efficient disaster response is effective communication between various domains and information sources, emergency managers, and those impacted by the disaster or emergency event. There's a serious communication problem between the science committee and the boots on the ground. In weather-related events, any opportunity to strengthen the capabilities of the interface between the science or the research domain and the social or operational domain is typically an opportunity to strengthen and enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of operations. Research and empirical studies have shown improving efficiency and effectiveness of operations is directly related to further reduction of loss of life and property damage for many weather-related hazards. A similar program that comes to mind with this translator is called the Rosetta Stone. The term Rosetta Stone has been used idiomatically to represent a crucial key in the process of decryption when, encoded, when encoding information, especially when a small but representative sample is recognized as the clue to understanding a larger whole. The first output of this will be a simplified pilot platform uh, based on the validated research that one has already done. Uh, we will use that for flooding, taking in the national water model behind it to distribute it out so that it will be transportable to any community throughout the United States beyond the borders of Tuscaloosa. Um, this is a uh, flow chart that we've created to kind of simulate our, our translation model. It's a conceptual framework that enables the translation between your science cloud and your social cloud and the needs of citizens and first responders. Eventually, we'd like to get to this point with our um, um, exercises and training. So basically, this is a disaster generation platform um, designed to handle uh, different levels of complexity, different mission areas, different scenarios, different disaster types. Eventually, we'd like to take this to a whole community approach and a whole all hazards approach. Based on what we've been exposed to today in the Summer Institute, it appears the strengthening of the capabilities of the interface between the science component and the operational component might be an opportunity to strengthen and enhance the efficiency and effectiveness of operations while reducing the loss of life and property for all hazards. The specific hazards that we will address will be flooding and other meteorological hazards um, based on the interaction with the National Water Model. What our project translation platform or framework is trying to achieve is to put the interconnections together to allow translated information to flow from scientific data to operational first responders and vice versa. Communication should be a two-way street. One of the platforms that we're thinking to leverage our ideas on is called RIMSIM. It was written by Bruce D. Campbell, and in fact, USGS has put it put it out and is using a training model, or not training model, training manual for its use. It's also been funded by Homeland Security. This would be a great starting point given that the code is open source for us to clean up and use as a connection to what Dr. David Mayman's concepts and ideas are. So what's the difference between our platform and RIMSIM? So RIMSIM is purely hypothetical. It's all training exercises using hypothetical data. Our platform would be doing that as well as real-time mode. So that would be with live feed for actual events or incidents using real data. Our objectives are to translate sophisticated science data, hierarchically sort and analyze, 
and deliver only those pieces of information that are required as usable to the efforts of specific agents or actors in their efforts as first responders or citizens. We'd also like to produce citizen maps or distribution channels to the public. Ultimately, our point is to save lives and property. Um, this is just a quote from EMA Director of Tuscaloosa County, Rob Robertson. As Tuscaloosa has well seen, the put, when push comes to shove, you have to have a major emergency or disaster. You have to have all your partners coming together and working together. They need to be able to communicate. They need to know what the others will be doing, who is responsible for what. Thank you. I'll open the floor for questions. So, uh, is there any question from the audience? So, is this going to be like a software that's... So, you hold on. So, is this going to be a piece of software that uh, the first responders install or everyone interested install that can communicate? So, if they, they can view stuff, but they can also send stuff to the cloud yeah. or something? Yes, so um, the point of this is for them to only get the specific information that they need. So yes, you're right. Do you have anything to add? It's a push down system. It's a, yeah, right. It's, so it's, it's a push down system. We're going to push these apps, these apps down to these particular um, roles or um, first responders or citizens that need that kind of specific information. So other re re information for like first responders may be restricted to citizens. So just um, generally, what is your, um, what are your kind of main steps you're going to take in your plan of action for getting this done within the next four and a half or so weeks? Uh, <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, we're working with uh, the CAPS group here at University of Alabama, and uh, we have uh, decided that um, a pilot using a very restricted application of inundation, flooding, and swift water rescue uh, would be a good exercise of one particular slice of this uh, translator module. And uh, we have uh, 140 programmers over there that tend to agree with us, so we're quite excited about their participation. Uh, but again, uh, five and a half weeks is a very short period of time, so we'll work out the flow charts, the logistics, We'll present the, the larger concept in detail, and we'll uh, create a pilot that will prove up uh, potentially for future funding or uh, for future opportunities for development uh, as we pass out of the Summer Institute. So any other question? Okay. So looks like we have more audience online. Um, so, so those of you who are online, I have uh, Mr. Ed Clark, who is the um, Director of Intelligence for National Water Center. So I would like to uh, like him to talk about uh, what we did over the last two weeks and um, from this point where, where we are going with the project. Well, and, and I, I want to thank you for the four notice and, and asking those questions of me. Um, so for those, of the, those folks on the phone, uh, it's been two, two very exciting weeks. Uh, our course coordinators, Adnan and Piranga, have been tirelessly supporting the students. Uh, the students, in turn, and the, and the uh, assistant theme leaders and the theme leaders, uh, as well as faculty from a couple of our uh, uh, universities that have been here uh, formulating ideas, coming up with, uh, with the, the basis for some of these projects, and then letting the folks that we're presenting today really run with it. Um, it's been really fun to watch, and that's kind of the spirit of what the Innovators Program and the Summer Institute is. Uh, and what Dr. Maven had proposed uh, two years ago when he envisioned sweaty bodies and reggae music uh, working on hydrology applications in the basement of the National Water Center. I don't know if we'll quite do that, but I think we're, um, we're on, the, on the course for some pretty dynamic uh, projects and some pretty uh, uh, leading edge or uh, brown brick breaking uh, uh, applications in hydrology, water resources, and then emergency re management response. 
over the last week, there was a, a group here, um, and the students participated with the emergency management community, included the mayor of Tuscaloosa, uh, first responders, uh, nonprofits, NGOs. Since that time, the that information, that 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 single event, that single day, has risen all the way up to uh, Department of Commerce level interest as, wow, how come we haven't done this in the last 50 years? So, um, I'm very appreciative of all of this, this folks that participated in that. I think it's been a been a pretty good effort for us to, uh, to hang our hats off of and just excited to see where the next five weeks get us. I, I will uh, build on Chris's question to the previous group and suggest that in addition to having a strategy to get this done in four and a half, five and a half weeks or five weeks that that involves laying out milestones and coming up with project plans, you also need to pray because uh, quite frankly that's a monumental lift. So keep your fingers crossed. This is exciting. So thanks for that, Don. Okay, so uh, next next group, uh, we have the presentation from Stahab and his team. Uh, they belong to the uh, flood inundation mapping team. Hello, everyone. So I'm Shahab Afshari. I'm uh, the team leader of the group. Uh, my team members are uh, Esan Omranian and Dongmei uh, Feng. And we're going to talk about the comparison of the flood inundation extent and depth by using different physical and non-physical models. So this is uh, an outline of our uh, group. Actually, uh, we are going to collaborate with uh, the team member eight uh, in the following session. And uh, these are the outline of our uh, two groups that we are going to uh, work on the production of the physical and non-physical model and also uh, calibration of the physical models and also non-physical models. And also, we're going to uh, give feedback to the, uh, the other group, which are going to work on the satellite remote sensing images and uh, producing uh, uh, flood inundation uh, maps and depths. And we're going to compare our flood inundation maps with ones that are observed in remote sensing images. Uh, and the other group uh, would uh, help us in uh, doing the raster calculation and raster analysis. So our study domain is Texas, uh, one of the uh, basin of the Texas, that is San Antonio Basin. And uh, its total drainage area is uh, 11,000 square kilometer. And also it contains 19 USGS stream flow gauges. And the major flow uh, runs about 240 miles from uh, Bexar County to uh, Guadalupe River. So in our uh, uh, model structure, the physical model would contain two different uh, physical models. Uh, one is HECRAS uh, that I'm to work with. And the input for the HECRAS model is land cover that is provided by NLCD and also DM or train models that can be provided by LIDAR images or USGS DM, and also inflow time series that can be provided by national water model. And we are, go uh, we are going to analyze 2D on a CD flow uh, analysis that either diffusion wave and sand vein on the scheme can be, uh, uh, can be in uh, employed for developing dynamic flood inundation map and also 2D steady flow analysis, uh, and they can produce static map. And the outputs of the HECRAS model can be flood inundation extent, 2D velocity distribution, 2D depth distribution, and other key hydraulics uh, that can be stream uh, power and so forth. So this is some uh, kind of a snapshot of outcome of HECRAS model. So at the top left, you would see uh, the DM or train model that you can uh, use as an input in HECRAS model. And on the uh, right side, there is a mesh grid 
that is a uh, kind of a structural and non-structural mesh grid along the river uh, reach you can have a non-structural grid but f along the uh, uh, floodplain they can be structural and it uh, would solve a um, finite volume scheme for uh, solving 2D flow modeling and in the down left, you would see the maximum inundation extent for a 100-year flood. Each cell would show the uh, their would show their ultimate uh, stage or depth value in that region. Also, the other physical model would be Geisha model. Same, uh, likewise, uh, Hecras it can uh, have uh, land cover and DM train models and inflow time series as inputs. But in addition, precipitation, initial moisture, and infiltration can be also regarded as additional input argument. But uh, in order to compare models together, we're going to just take into account the similar inputs in all models. And the outputs of the Geisha model can be 2D depth distribution like uh, HECRAS and flood inundation extent, key hydraulics, and overland uh, flow discharge. This is a snapshot of uh, Geisha model outcome for different time episodes. And that is the Northport levee in uh, Alabama, Tuscaloosa. And this is the uh, non-physical model uh, auto route that uh, is going to be uh, uh, analyzed and evaluated and compared with the uh, other models. So likewise, uh, the uh, previous two physical models, the inputs for the other route can be DEM and or train model and uh, stream mask and inflow time series that can be provided by national water model. And it would use control, uh, sorry, for, uh, volume fill method and Manning's equation just to solve a steady state flow uh, regime. And the output of this uh, model is flood inundation extent and uh, flood depth. And the last one is the hand, that is a terrain uh, model which uh, normalizes the uh, topo uh, topo topographic uh, images according to the local uh, relative uh, height uh, found along the drainage network system, and this way uh, represent the topology of the uh, relative uh, gravitational potential or local uh, draining uh, potential. And it would use the same inputs like uh, auto route as a DM or train models and water elevation that can be provided from national water model. And uh, just uh, as a conclusion, we are going to, uh, first of all, compare the outcome of the hand and auto route model with the physical model uh, that are uh, HECRAS and Geisha model, and just for sake of comparison of those. And also, the next uh, uh, approach would be the calibration of the HECRAS and Geisha model and use them uh, by means of helping uh, from the next group uh, that would work on the remote sensing images and try to uh, find out the calibrated uh, flood inundation uh, map by means of uh, finding out the uh, some raster analysis and compare it with the uh, actual flood inundation map that is provided by remote sensing. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Read one. So are you focusing on any particular event or? So uh, that would be a kind of a flood event in uh, San, uh, San Antonio uh, River Basin and that would be two uh, time episodes. One is the flood event, actual flood event, and the um, time before and after the flood event. So we're going to compare these two. So as far as we are, uh, we are hopeful to have enough information like uh, raster imagery that are providing us with the flood inundation 
zones and uh, some uh, robust inputs that can be provided by national water model so we can develop those uh, so schemes. you're going to need the simulation run from the national water model what's that so you're going to need the simulation run yeah from the national water model so yeah i think that's an issue i think you need to talk about like if it's available or not mm -hmm. sure so that's one issue i think you should you need to address so um, actually, the team advisor for this flood inundation mapping team is Dr. Saggy Cohen from University of Alabama. So he has a question. Uh, well, first of all, you don't actually need or necessarily need the, the water model because you can just use the gauge data. You have 14, 14 gauging stations. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Okay. Um, but so questions. Um, First of all, did you think of a, did you guys thought of a matrix of how to compare the different models? How are you going to judge? Are there? Each of us would provide uh, the group uh, that would be the eighth, uh, eighth group, uh, our remote sensing group, they're over there. Sixth group, okay. So they are the uh, people which are uh, going to help us in uh, comparing uh, outcome of each different model, physical and non-physical models, by means of doing some raster analysis. And each of those raster analysis uh, uh, would be, uh, what was the name of that uh, analysis? You said uh, image, uh, yeah, change detection. So. By means of those uh, methods, you can find how much uh, your flood inundation map provided by uh, or produced by the physical and non-physical model are conforming the actual uh, flood inundation map that is uh, given by the remote sensing images. And by means of that, we can argue about how uh, those uh, models are predictable. The predictability of those models uh, is high or significant. Yeah, one more question. The hand method, are you going to use the uh, existing hand database, which is 10 meter national scale, or are you going to try to run it at, uh, for the LIDAR data if you have it, which will be somewhat more difficult? So I want to answer it this way. We were uh, we are going to uh, make all those inputs that are going to be used for each model similar. So that's one, one of our main issues and our concerns. And also, the raster imagery uh, must be compatible, or we should be compatible with the raster imagery resolution and quality. And if we are going to do some uh, raster sampling or reclassification, that would increase our uncertainty. So everything must be well adjusted to each other. And uh, we, actually, if we are going to use a hand model that is 10 meter by 10 meter, we should be uh, confident to say that the raster imagery that would provide us flood foundation map are 10 meter by 10 meter. Uh, not necessarily, I don't think. Uh, but uh, well, we can talk about it. OK. Yeah. OK, so big hand for Dong Mei, Esan, and Shahab. And any any question for this group from the online audience? Well, you can actually provide your comments in the chat box. Um, okay. Okay. So the next group is flood emergency response. Okay, Jim, Mike, and Paul. You want to use this today? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Mike, and then Jim and, call, uh, Jim and Paul, um, and we're kind of working on two smaller scale um, projects, one in the data simulation and then one in the emergency response. Um, the first project that we're looking at is kind of trying to identify a way of how to take all this flood information that we're getting and distribute it at the individual level. Um, some of the things we've seen so far is that a lot of the warnings and advisories that we see aren't very spatially explicit and they don't really give individuals much of an idea of what to actually do. Um, kind of sends them off driving into, into floods at times. So our main goal with this is to take the data from the National Water Center, use uh, the ESRI platform, and distribute flood information to individuals. And we're looking at this not so much as a hydrology problem, but as a routing problem with kind of a traditional um, origin point, destination point, and obstacle. 
So um, our origin point is going to be generated by an individual's uh, mobile cell phone. So they're broadcasting their GPS signal, and so we'll know their location. That's the origin. The destination, you can see here, this is a map of uh, Alabama with all of the churches in the state of Alabama. We're defaulting to the churches. Ideally, at the end stage, we will be using um, <laughs> We'll be using all of the Red Cross shelters, but for now we're going to default to churches because we have that point data already. Um, and then our obstacle is going to be a uh, flood inundation map generated by the hand method, uh, which is pr produced by the uh, national water model outputs. So we found there's, there's a uh, ArcGIS has a, a platform for creating mobile apps cross-platform, so they work on Android and iOS and all devices. So we're going to go ahead and, and give that a shot using ArcGIS Online. And from there, possibly cooperate with, with the first group that presented with their flood emergency response stuff and, and get a connection through CAPS to try and develop more professional apps in, in Android and iOS that are uh, platform specific. So I'm going to pass it back to Mike now so he can introduce the second mini project we're working on. And one key point with this, uh, with the destinations that we're looking at is a feature we're trying to implement is that they can be turned on and off. So the Red Cross manager, whoever is in charge of it, will be able to reroute you to uh, um, destinations that are either open or available. So the second project that we're looking at um, has to do with the stations that we took at the Cahaba River the other day. And <laughs> so we took, we took these cross sections, and uh, or the USGS took these cross sections, and we're going to try to go out tomorrow and with a traditional land survey using a total station, try to georeference them to really where they are on the stream. And then that will give us a 2D flow um, velocity measurements. Um, and then using the UVA, or not the UVA, the U of A stations that they implemented over the river, kind of look at how, how they compare. And Jim's going to give a little more info on that. Uh, right. So we, we went out to the Cahaba River and we took, the yeah, USGS took eight uh, really nice bathymetry and uh, uh, subsurface uh, velocity profiles. So we also have that point sensor. So we're going to see if we can generalize that point sensor measurement out to a cross-sectional area. Uh, we're also going to try and use IRIC to try and model. We have really nice upper and lower boundary conditions set by these bathymetry cross-sections. So we'll see how well the model reproduces what the USGS actually measured, and then how well the sensor itself reproduces uh, what was actually measured. Um, so our question essentially is, uh, can a, a ADV, an acoustic Doppler velocimeter, <laughs> measurement be extrapolated to a 2D stream measurement uh, to save time and money for the USGS? Uh, as opposed to going out and measuring it every week. And yeah, so I think the common common thing between between all uh, both of our projects is how do you get this to an individual level to either save potential lifetime or cost, whether that's USGS or individual civilians. And yeah, any questions? Questions? So uh, for, for that uh, app, just to make sure I understand, so there's some sort of input about, in a, about the flood occurring from whatever system we develop, mm -hmm. and then it's going to, again, just say what, what's going to happen next? So Yeah, so the general idea is that if you get this broad um, weather advisory, oh, there's a flood in your county, you get a more specific one of, oh, you are actually, based on your GPS location, going to be in, in the potential flood. Um, inundation or whether you should move. And if you should move, it's going to give you a link to a map using Esri's routing or network analysis that tells you here's your closest active um, destination and here's how to get there. Any other question? So I have one question. So don't you think the validation of ADV is kind of not consistent with the other part? or how coherent they are? How coherent these two projects are? Uh, they're not coherent. They're two different projects. Um, <laughs> the mobile app was our original idea. And yesterday, the uh, USGS people were mentioning that they want people to go out and survey. And uh, we haven't had enough of the heat yet. So we volunteered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so the next uh, next presentation is by Brenda, Mark, and Kyung Min. Okay, so our project is a verification project of national water model forecasts and uh, we're applying this to a case study in the Arroyo Colorado River in South Texas. So the idea is to develop validation infrastructure for the national water model. Um, you know, it's producing continuous uh, forecast products and uh, we'd like to get an idea of how well those uh, perform when compared against real data. Um, so the idea is to develop verification as a service, so you'll have a uh, verification program running on a server that uh, incorporates both forecasts and uh, data from the USGS and potentially other sources. Um, and uh, the interface to this we would like to put into a Tethys app so that the user can uh, query uh, questions about how well the model performs in certain conditions, certain forecast lead times, certain locations. Um, and then we'll end up with a queryable database of performance metrics. Um, and then applying that in a specific case study to national, uh, to uh, sprint output, which is a, a different kind of hydrologic model uh, for the Arroyo Colorado River in South Texas. So the idea of model validation is that you have a model that's uh, making predictions, in this case it's making forecasts. Um, and then you have, uh, independent of that, you have a data set that you can compare those to. Um, and so this fi figure on the left is showing just generically, you know, a model that's producing the, the dotted line and uh, observed data, which are the, the red squares. And it's not a perfect fit, so you, you want to have some uh, measurement of, of how good that fit is. And so you develop different statistics, and I've shown two at the, at the right. So that's the natural fat cliff efficiency on top and percent bias on the bottom. Um, and so that's, that would be a way to uh, determine quantitatively how well your model is performing. So uh, thinking about the verification as a service infrastructure, um, you want to have, uh, so, so we want to develop um, this verification engine that's running on a server and that the user can interact with um, to, to figure out how well the model is performing on a task that they're specifically interested in. Um, so the, the flow is from, or the user experience, I guess, is going from left to right. Uh, so the user defines inputs such as location, date range or season, um, hydrological condition, forecast lead time. And then the, the verification engine is pulling in data um, from the USGS or HydroShare or elsewhere, um, and it's pulling in national water model forecasts. And then it's uh, calculating, calculating statistics uh, and then presenting those as outputs to the user um, that they can then potentially download and uh, use as they, as they like. So um, I think Brenda is going to talk about the, the, uh, the case study area. So the area we selected is a basin, well, it's a basin in South Texas. It's part of the Nueces Rio Grande Coastal Basin, and it drains into the Laguna Madre, which is a bay in South Texas. Uh, we selected this area because it's very flat and it's very prone to error, so we thought that we could get um, a good validation there. The area is um, relatively small. It's 706 square miles, and the river is 90 miles long. So one of our goals for um, comparing is comparing the output from spin model and national water model. So to make some prediction from national water model, we're going to use uh, the simulated runoff data from national water model. We got put in into the uh, spin model for, and um, we're going to use the runoff data from national water model, and NHD plus flow line data, and river geometry is kind of like Manning van like cross-sectional data, we're going to put them in a sprint model, we run it, so we can, we can get the flow rate, weighted area, and surface elevation data from um, the sprint model. So we're going to make some comparison between the output from the sprint and 
uh, natural model models, so we can see that the product did well or not. Yep. And this is uh, all of our team members. So Brenda is going to be doing the case study guidance for, uh, and motivation. So she is well, she know well, knows well about that area, so she came from there. So she can take some uh, data collection from the area of Colorado. And I'm going to do the data processing from a for the spring and natural water model output. And I'm going to run the spring model for that area. And Mark would be do the data comparison and validation. And she, he would be going to do the like verification as a service back and development things. And this is our project schedule. So for the, uh, during this weekend and next week, we're going to start starting up for uh, getting the data. And I'm going to be working on the data processing for National Water Model and Sprint. And I'm going to be running for um, the model. And we're going to do the comparison between uh, National Water Model and Sprint. And the, those are things. And we're going to conclude up for the last week. So this is it. Any questions? OK, so questions? Um, so just to make sure I understand the last part of it, the validation. So are you going to be comparing um, like USGS gauge data that's observed data to the uh, no, we are water model? We, we are comparing the uh, like forecasting data from National Water Model. We have just one US gauge at our subject area. So we're going to compare the output from National Water Model. It's kind of like prediction from there. And we're going to compare the output from the um, spring model, too. I, I would add, so that's in our specific case study for the Aurora Colorado. The, the general infrastructure um, will pull in USGS data. And the, the issue in the Aurora Colorado is there's only one stream gauge. So we'd like to get uh, an idea of how well these models compare. OK, so for if you have just the one stream gauge, um, then you're not going to be using that one to compare to all the streams in the area? Or are you just taking it from the stream that the gauge is on and comparing those? OK, so we have one stream gauge by USGS, but it's in the tidal zone, so it's not very reliable because um, you get flow back from the, from the coast. Uh, and we have two other gauges that are by IBWC, so it's not like, I don't know how we're going to be getting data from those. I mean, we can get it for our models, but yeah. OK. Any other question? So the one concern is uh, you, you won't have enough forecast data because there is no hind gas. So you need to work with the operational forecast data. That is the thing. It's a, that's three weeks of data. So you need to select something, some matrix that, that is not affected by sampling uncertainty. So that's one issue I think you need to address. Uh, regarding the data, so uh, currently Fernando has two to three months historical data, which is available from National Water Model Run. And I also have some uh, archived uh, half year last year's data from a pre previous version of National Water Model Output. So there are some historical data if you want to use. So I'm not clear about the comparison between Sprint and the National Water Model. Isn't one uh, just discharge and the other would be water surface elevation from what I don't know much about sprint. So are you talking about the input or output? The output, compare output. the output, right? That's what you you want to do. Yeah, um, for the output, we can make some lasers uh, from the sprint. We can get the flow rate and radiated area and surface elevation. And I believe like National Water Model can predict um, here is like laser bird inflow and outflow and elevation. And I think we can like visualize we can how how we can make it fit or not. Yes. Actually I have the same question. So what will be the your what will be the input forcing for sprint? Are you taking output from the national water model then for sprint to run? Yeah, so I'm gonna 
I need a lot of data for learning sprints. So I'm going to use the uh, simulated data from national order model as an input for the sprint model. So Yeah, then yeah. when you say comparing sprint and national water model, so that is sometimes unclear, just like what Dr. Bowen said. There is one, one, one clarification that may help is, so the idea with spring here is she will force spring with the simulated flow from national water model or, I mean, in reality, any model. You create a virtual observed uh, network. Um, and a spring being a dynamic wave uh, model should give you uh, as good a prediction as you can get. No? And then you can compare that to, uh, you know, she could compare those to outputs from the natural model itself or in forecast mode or, or, or in simulation mode uh, that it's using a, a simplified routing model. So it's really a comparison of uh, routing uh, models that she, she will be able to do with this uh, uh, approach. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alfonso. So another question. So I just want to add something about Sprint here. So the only difference between Sprint and the national water model is the channel routing part. So, so for the national water model, we use the Muskingum and county method to do a hydrological routing. But for Sprint, we saw the St. Wind land equation to do a one-dimensional hydraulic routing. So the input for Sprint will be, we will get an inflow from the very upstream. And for each catchment, we will get a surface runoff and a surface runoff, then we will do the, the hydraulic routing for each rate, for each NHD ridge. So the only difference is the channel routing part, I think. Any other question? And so just a comment. Uh, we have um, retrospective data for the last couple of years, so um, any time period that you guys want to study, we can extract some of that data out and share it. Um, I think it goes back to 2012 or so, 2011, yeah, so. Just caution that it's not trivial to extract that, so we, we're not going to pull the five-year period for everywhere, uh, but we can pull, pull a little bit, so just be patient. <laughs> yeah, I mean. If you guys can narrow the time frames down that you specifically want and then compile that all across all projects into a list, uh, then we can work on getting some of that data. Okay. Thank you. Next presentation is on continental water balance uh, by Ryan and Ling Cheng and Emily. Uh, so we were working with Dr. Albert Van Dyke uh, from Australia on the continental water balance theme. So first I want to start off with a simplified national water model. Uh, first we have meteorologic modeling and basin modeling. And you've seen this figure before, and I just wanted to give you some context. So that is the meteorologic modeling. And uh, these later four components are what we actually combine into basin modeling. And just for context, hand is actually calculated after the channel routing. And I think traditionally we kind of see it as a, as a product more than something that could actually feed back into the model. And we want to show how it can be uh, used to alter the model and come up with better flood prediction. Uh -oh. I guess there's something wrong with the picture. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, let's see. Yeah. No, something happened to the picture going to the windows. Uh, anyway, I'll just get through this. What we had, we had a, a general a hydrologic cycle that we were going to relate the national water model to. And basically we divided that up into each component that's modeled by the, the different components of the water model. Uh, the three X's that you see are actually from 
uh, interflow in the soil, which NOAA MP actually combines with the aquifer flow before it's uh, taken to the NHD plus stream network and then routed. That component is not there. Also, there is no recharge of groundwater from the uh, channel routing, and there is no flood modeling. Floods actually do not go back into the model to impact uh, future calculations. So that's something that we wanted to work on. So we have identified those two areas. So that was actually the flooding component that you see there. And then the second component that I want to point out, this is actually a hydrologic cycle for one watershed. But the reality is that you have multiple watersheds, and actually they can uh, have backwater impact on this watershed. And you have to have some kind of function that is going to uh, account for that. And so those are the two problems that we're looking to solve. So, okay, this is the modeling a flood. So in the left side, you can see the uh, water balance part in the channel. So in physical process, it will uh, include the, uh, the stream flow in, Q in, and Q out, the ET in the channel, and the infrastructure in the channel. But in the uh, national water model, it's only uh, about the uh, stream flow in and the stream flow out. So uh, the right side is the uh, flooding inundation model. They, they use the hand and the, uh, the hand and the area to uh, calculate the volume. So right here is uh, it didn't uh, it doesn't account for the effect of water slope and the backwater flow just as Ryan said. So. So here is uh, some problems about the flood effect on the channel routing. You, you can see the picture. This is pre-flood, and this is the during flood. So there is uh, a way back sp um, spares can attenuate the flood waves, which means the flood will stay maybe in more time, more long, longer. So the more attention should be uh, maybe discovered during our investigation. In our mind, this can be solved uh, by retrospective of the channel routing and used in the subsequent calculation. <laughs> so now I want to show you the, the second problem. The second problem had to do with the multiple basins. So this is actually NOAA MP. And no MP is actually calculated for every single grid. And then it's run uh, and uh, routed through the DEM. And then after we get all of the channel routing, then the hand method is applied. And I'm going to show you that. And now I want to show you a profile cutting across the DEM and the hand method. And on the top left, you see the hand method. On the bottom left, you see the DEM. At the four intersections of the different catchments, you can see the problem between the hand method and the DEM. And uh, what, you, what you lose is this idea that you can have different temporary storages at different elevations when you use the hand method. So what we would like to do is actually to update the hand method to where we could, or modify it to where we could account for these different temporary storage areas that are on the sides. So this is our proposed model structure. You have the national water model. And what we want to do, and what we already have, actually, the national water model is already producing the channel routing calculating volume that we need. Okay, And then we take that with the hand model, and we can actually calculate um, the extent of the flood inundation. So what we want to do is actually to take that information first and plug that back into the channel routing, because that's not being accounted for right now. The second step that we want to take is to actually develop a new method, and two, three, four, et cetera. And these would be based off of the stream order. So you could have a hand that is kind of a hybrid between the actual height above the nearest drainage and the DEM. <clears throat> then these methods could actually uh, be used to find which one models the uh, multiple basin scenario better, and then that used to further improve the channel routing. Are there any questions? Any 
question? So I have one question. So this is uh, actually a classical issue of surface retention or ponding. So uh, do you think you are going to tweak the NOMP source code for resolving this issue? No. Actually, these the hand model will go directly back into the channel routing. And we've actually talked to Ed about doing some of this. OK. OK, anyways, we can talk about that later. Yeah, <laughs> Thank so, you so if, if, if I can add. Uh, the channel routing would just treat this basically as a temporary reservoir. And the reservoir can move across the landscape. And what the hand two, three, and four have to offer is that they can basically determine the size of the reservoir. And uh, they're flex more flexible than just the hand model, because the hand model works well when it's within one catchment. But that's not reality. Reality is that these catchments are network, and you need to account for the relationship between the catchments. Yeah, if I could add. Um I don't know if I think I interpret your question. We're not linking that potted water back into no MP for infiltration. I think that's what the proposal is. I think that would be you know, significantly uh, more challenging for a five-week, four-week project. We'll talk about praying for a miracle. Uh, but it's, it's an important issue nonetheless in terms of just removing that water from the downstream hydrograph. And we've already seen, in fact, the images of the Rio Brazos. Am I saying that right for everybody from Texas? Uh, the Rio Brazos um, had it already documented pretty substantially higher than expected flood peak downstream. And uh, also, these, these calculations, they're not iterative. They actually just go into the next time step. It does not affect the, you know, the, the first or the previous time step. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Krishna and Yanting. So they're the other group from flood inundation mapping. Thank you. Uh, so before we start the presentation, we're going to have a quiz. How many of you remember how much uh, Shahab explained about the project? So what does flood inundation mean? Let's start with that. OK, so uh, I'm Krishna. I'm from NC State. Uh, we have Yan Ting uh, from UT Dallas. Uh, uh, we're working with uh, Dr. Cohen uh, for uh, on using remote, sen remote sensing images uh, for doing the flood inundation mapping. Um, so let's begin. So uh, we have a term called uh, equifinality, uh, just uh, coined by Yan et al. Uh, recently, which basically says that uh, you, you are, you're going to get a decent result when you combine the outcomes of different flood inundation models with, with the remote sensing uh, images. So the, the limitation for that is the temporal resolution because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you, the, you, you might not have the, uh, uh, a satellite image at the exact time when you have the peak flow of your image. So, uh, so immediately, that's going to be a problem because it's it's not a it's not an apples to apples comparison over there. Um, so, the method we are proposing is we're just going to add more data, uh, and we are going to use historical data, and we are so and we're going to try to improve the existing change detection techniques uh, to get a better solution. Uh, so, this is the pipeline of uh, what we're planning to do. Um, so, you guys must be bored of this. Um, Flow chart already. Okay, and you're going to get even more bored. Uh, so, to start off. Uh, you're good, uh, so, we, we're going to have uh, remote sensing images uh, coming in, and we're going to do a bit of uh, cleaning and data extraction, data ma uh, manipulation, and then uh, run it through a change detection technique to generate a flood extent. Okay, so step one: uh, getting the data. Again, this is this is. Uh, uh, this is a little problem uh, problematic because we, we need to look at uh, different satellites to um, figure out which is the uh, which satellite has the best spatial resolution and the temporal resolution. There is usually a trade-off between the spatial and temporal resolution. If you have good spatial, you won't have good temporal resolution, or vice versa. Um, and uh, the other problem is uh, uh, noise that comes in with most of the satellite images because. Um, uh, you, if you have cloud cover, which is which is going to be highly prevalent, especially when we have floods, uh, there's no point in uh, taking the images because you, the only thing you're going to see are clouds. Um, so one one uh, sa satellite uh, that that can overcome that issue is the Sentinel one, which gives you the SAR uh, synthetic aperture radar uh, data, and uh, 
it has a lot of modes. Uh, the best mode we found so far is uh, has a resolution of five meters. The temporal resolution is a, is a little bad. It's it's 12 days, so that's uh, something that we need to look into. Uh, the other uh, choice we have is the Fermo, uh, Fermosat, uh, which is, which which comes from Taiwan. Uh, it, it has uh, both good spatial and temporal resolution, but again, we have to get the data from Taiwan. So that's that's something we need to look into. Uh, so uh, uh, and. Uh, which region are we going to extract this data from? It depends on, uh, again, availability of data. Uh, and if and uh, assuming that the satellite was over that location during the time of the flood. Uh, one of the um, areas we have under consideration is the San Antonio River Basin in Texas, uh, mainly because, um, uh, I mean, uh, there have been a lot of floods over there in the recent past, and we are hoping uh, the law of permutations means that the satellite was going over that region at least once during that time. So the second step uh, is uh, data cleaning or extraction. Um, so uh, again, uh, we're going to have data in different bands, and you have to do a lot of normalization and uh, extracting data from images. Uh, again, like I mentioned before, you have the, the main issues come in with the uh, constraints regarding the different types of resolution, like spatial, uh, temporal, spectral, and also radiometric resolution. Uh, and uh, like I said, cloud cover makes a big has a big is a big issue. So you, you can see you have a really good uh, clear Landsat image at, at at a particular time stamp, but when you really need it, the second Landsat image is what you really need, and it is pretty much useless for us. So like I said, the solution is to use uh, SAR images and also try to use multiple inputs. Uh, uh, both of our advisors have have been uh, expert are, are experts in. Uh, change detection techniques, and uh, there, there have been a bunch of uh, um, publications in the recent past which, which make use of uh, multiple inputs at, uh, from different satellites to offer change detection. So we're going to explore literature to find out a good technique. Uh, third, uh, third part is change detection. So uh, change detection, as the name suggests, it just, it, it's going to uh, identify which locations uh, are different when compared to the uh, uh, compared to a, a base image, which obviously has no floods in it. Um, there are uh, several uh, hundreds of change detection techniques, but primarily we can categorize them as pixel-based or object-based. So a pixel-based technique is where, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the names, as the name suggests, you're going to compare pixels uh, against each other. You're going to compare different bands. Now, uh, the, the, the problem with the pixel-based techniques is uh, it might lead to incorrect uh, georeferencing unless your pixels are uh, correctly georeferenced, like your, 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 you say a pixel number 10 is always referring to the National Water Center, you're going to have, uh, it's always going to say there's a change, because if something else comes in that location, it's going to say there's a change. Uh, the other technique is object-based uh, um, uh, change detection, uh, which has been become popular in the, in the past up to 10 years, I guess. Um, and it's, um, what, what you're doing in object-based det uh, change, uh, change detection is, you're identifying objects from a base image, so you're doing some things like segmentation, and then you're going to compare all the segments together to identify if they are the same. So if you look at the image over there, uh, I'm partially colorblind, so I'm hoping the first one is red. So the red and the blue, so uh, the, the V and the U, uh, uh, if, if, if the image is segmented correctly, the V and U would indicate that they're, um, they're two different you know, the, the difference of that's where a change has occurred, but if the segmentation is not, not does not is not done correctly, and you end up with the two uh, images where you, you can see at the bottom, then it, it's going to say there's a change everywhere. So the the proposed uh, technique we are talking about is is going to be a dynamic change detection technique. Um, so so we're going to do uh, some initial segmentation like uh, using some technique like a very basic uh, k-means clustering algorithm. Uh, and then we're going to do a shape similarity by comparing all the segments together. And then um, based on whether we got a good uh, segmentation or not, we're going to repeat the step once again uh, to get a better segmentation. Um, and then, uh, okay, sorry, I forgot about this image. <laughs> right, so, uh, so the, 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 uh, this is what we have uh, planned for the next four, uh, four weeks. I mean, um, we are hoping to build uh, an, an efficient um, uh, change detection algorithm, and then once uh, if once we have that algorithm, the idea is, uh, given we have enough uh, source data, 
we we repeat this step uh, multiple times like at different time stamps and find out uh, the 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 flood extents and then uh, oh sorry so what what uh, you'll end up having is um, so the the boxes you see are there uh, assume that they are the flood extents at different time stamps so by by getting the polygons of flood extents at different time stamps we can get the velocity of the flood from directly from the satellite images um, and then we can compare uh, them, uh, the, the hydrograph generated in this way with the historical events and results. So again, uh, here's uh, uh, another example. So uh, here's a sample output from uh, something that Wiki was working on before. Uh, uh, so we have uh, a, a picture of a satellite a picture of, uh, of, uh, of a region in UT Dallas, and we ran it through uh, e-cognition software that, does, uh, uh, that can perform segmentation. So the two regions over there, you, uh, the, two, the, two, the biggest problems are over-segmentation or under-segmentation. So because uh, you have to deal with issues like shadows and you know, uh, uh, color uh, of neighboring regions being too similar. So an, an over-segmentation is when, uh, because of the shadows, it's, uh, imagine that there are only two buildings. It's going to give a, end up giving us like four or five buildings. Uh, and under-segmentation is the exact opposite. Like when we have four, four buildings, it's only showing one building because of the um, the issues with color and the bands. So uh, so finally, uh, this picture again. Uh, so the final outline of the of the project is like I said. Uh, once we have a flood extent, we're going to compare our results with uh, the flood extents developed uh, developed by uh, Shahab's team. Um, the idea is uh, so we're going to have uh, the, we're going to treat the flood uh, flood extents as polygons. So. Uh, we're going to do a kind of an intersection to find out the area of overlap between both of the both these uh, solutions, and we, we we can develop a metric to identify how accurate uh, either technique is. So um, the challenges for this week, like I said, there have been a lot of floods in Texas. So we're going to sit and uh, scout through SAR and try to find uh, the images for SAR for uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas. Um, and identify the, uh, the, the, the basin that has most data in, and ho also figure out a, an algorithm to it. Okay, thank you so much. Any question? Anyone? So how about the uncertainty in your remote sensing images? Because your remote sensing images will be eventually used by some other group as a reference. So uncertainty in your classification will hamper or, or dictate their results. So uh, eventually we have to compare the results with uh, some base technique. Uh, that's the reason why we, we didn't say we, don't, we want others to compare the results against us. We're going to compare our results against whoever has the best model. So for example, if you have calibrated results from, uh, um, from uh, Shahab's team, we can use that to compare against. Uh, we, uh, I can't say with certainty that the results we get from a national or from uh, from remote sensing are going to be 100% certain, but the, we'll, we'll try to get the closest we can. So how is the process of selecting the images, the cloud-free images? Is it by eye, or how they want to choose? No, so image? we're not saying we're going to select cloud-free images. We're saying we're going to select SAR uh, images. So with SAR, uh, the, the, because it's a radar-based system, uh, it doesn't matter if there are clouds, because the band collects the information of, of the land. Question. So, did you say you're gonna combine multiple remote sensing products, or no. you're gonna just use just do one? So uh, the idea is, so because there are so many remote sensing techniques, um, we're going to see and try to modify an existing technique or come up with a new technique altogether. Uh, some some object-based remote sensing tech, uh, change detection technique that will work for flood inundation. Right? Um, Vicky's been working in that area for a, for a while now, and I've been working in change detection for some time. So we're going to uh, you know, gather resources together and see what works best. Yeah, also, multi-source sensor images, fusing multi-source images, it's also a very strong technique. OK, so next presentation. So Amir and Mohammed. Uh, they are um, representing the data assimilation team.
UT Arlington. Uh, during this uh, summer institute, we will be working on data assimilation. We selected Iowa State as our study area. Uh, they have collected a dense data set for the entire state. They have uh, LiDAR data with one meter resolution for the entire state. They have collected thousands of uh, cross sections. And as you can see in the figure at right, uh, the red squares are the USGS stations and uh, green squares are uh, water surface elevation that they have collected. Uh, in this slide, uh, we are going to shortly talk about our um, methodology. So we have the output from a national water model and we take a flow from this model. And we use uh, a model, probably hand, or we might use uh, some other method to predict the uh, water elevation. We also have uh, observation from IFIS, uh, Iowa Flood Inundation System. So we have these two data, the model prediction and the observation, and we use them in, in the data assimilation box. And Finally, we um, provide the flood inundation map. We also uh, create these maps uh, without doing assimilation to compare it at the end, what's the difference before and after assimilating this data. Uh, since we are doing data assimilation in this project, we prefer to mostly talk about uh, data assimilation, not our model. And it would be useful for those of you who are not familiar with this term. Uh, you all know about uh, calibration. Your model uh, predicts the uh, state variables. You compare it with observation. And one of the easiest methods is uh, trial and error. You change the parameters and try to minimize the error between your model and your observation. But uh, data assimilation uh, is used for keep your, uh, keeping your model updated. So a process that updates the model as new observation become available is called data assimilation. So if you have uh, this figure from previous slide, you have calibrated your model, you run it until the ne next day that observations are available. So you have your uh, predicted state from the model and you have your observation. Data assimilation using the uncertainty in th these two data update the state variable. You use this updated state as your uh, initial condition for your model, and again, you run it for, uh, until the next day that observation is available, and the same procedure. There are uh, lots of methods for uh, data assimilation. We are going to use ensemble Kalman filter, and this is how it works. You have your model, and you have to create your ensembles by perturbing the uh, inputs of your model. So we create an uh, N model and we run them separately, and each model gives us the state variable. We take the average of ensembles, and using this average and uh, result from each model, we uh, calculate the covariance matrix of the model, which shows the error in the model. We also have error in the observation using data assimilation. We, we predict, uh, calculate the Kalman gate, and this Kalman gate updates all the state variables in the model. Question? So how are you going to create the ensemble? I mean, uh, from the national water model? No. Let's come back to this slide. So our uh, input to the model would be flow, which we get from the national water model. So we create an ensemble based on the flow. We change the flow, not the input to the national water model. So do you have anything? Oh, you're going to apply data assimilation to the flow? Yes. Oh, yes, uh, we change the flow, we create the uh, ensembles by changing the 
for example, hand model, and we predict pitch. You're going to change the parameters of hand model, and then yeah, the, 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 just the flow. Yes, and we assimilate H into the model. So are you, are you focusing on any particular lead time, like lead time one, two, three? And uh, I didn't get your So question. you need, like, you have forecast lead time okay. from national water model, like for different Q. You get different Q for different lead time, forecast lead time. Uh, actually, we are not using um, predictions. We are you are using just a just historic data because we are going to assimilate the observation of water surface elevation. If you don't have any predictions, so we have to use the historic data in the past, not predictions. You mean the simulation, not the for hindcast or forecast? Not the forecast. Yeah, not the forecast. No, not forecast. So, uh, any other question? Yeah, sure. So, I'm still not clear. So, you're simulating. I'm not clear what you're simulating, actually. Um, depth or water surface elevation. So, what are you modifying to simulate it? We. So this is our model. We uh, change the input to the model, which is Q. We create N models, and we predict N water surface elevation. And that's one of the issues, because uh, we don't know how much uncertainty we, we have in, the, in this model, because we cannot run it. So we might. Uh, consider a person like 10 percent, 15 percent uh, uncertainty in these flows, and we uh, randomly perturb this flow and get the, out, the output, which is water depth or surface elevation. Yes, uh, we can do that. Like, instead of uh, running this model several times, just you mean the look at the time series and Yes, yes, we might do that. Thank you. So who is next? Okay. So Hussein, Trees, and Ridwan. All right. Yeah, so our group is going to be looking at uh, quantifying uncertainty in flood inundation mapping using the national water model. Um, our group, you can see, is composed of the four listed students followed by the two advisors helping us along. But probably more important is that uh, with our powers combined, we become Team Hyphium. And really the sole purpose of that is so we can have an acronym because every scientific project needs an acronym. So, all right. So Team Hyphium, that is for hydrolo Hydrologic Hydraulic Ensemble Flood Inundation Uncertainty Mapping Team. Uh, but our objective uh, is to quantify uncertainty in the, in the models, uh, in the model-derived flood inundation mapping using uh, coupled hydrologic and hydraulic models. And we'll get into what we expect right now. And so uh, to, to obtain that objective, we split our project uh, outline into four main stages. The first stage is to define ensembles uh, from the national water model output. Um, we'll explain that in more detail here next. Uh, stage two of the project will be to, um, you, uh, to figure out uh, the uncertainty of the national water model output using those ensembles. Stage three will be to uh, take the uh, national water model ensemble output and use that to drive a couple hydrologic models. And then the output from those hydrologic models will use to quantify the final uncertainty and use that um, quantification of the uncertainty to do some visualization, hopefully convey uncertainty with our flood inundation mapping. Um, 
And so I'd like to turn it over here to Ridwan so he can talk a little bit more about uh, stage one and two, which he will be taking the lead on. So we are going to get the national water model outputs. Probably we'll get some historical forecast outputs for lead time one to three days. So, so we haven't decided the, uh, our location yet. So once we decide the location, then we will get the historical uh, model outputs for that region. And we're going to do some uncertainty analysis for the ensembles. So after that, uh, we'll do hydraulic modeling using probably one or two uh, hydraulic models. So this is going to be uh, discussed by Hussein. Yes, uh, my contribution will be the building of the hydraulic model uh, based on the training that we had here um, at the Summer Institute. We chose to build the model with the IRIC. IRIC, as you know, it uh, has the ability to run for 1D, 2D, and uh, 3D. And also it has uh, different um, solvers that can solve for the discharge in the channel, also the flooding. And uh, also, it has this nice ability to to, uh, to solve the equations for the bed form. So the idea is that to build the hydraulic model, first of all, as simple as possible, and then uh, after getting some results, add some more complexity to the model, such as the sediments, and see how it's going to change the uh, probably flood inundation map. Uh, beside the IRIC, we are interested to build uh, another hydraulic model with hex ROAS and probably, again, 2D model to provide um, the velocity and depth uh, for the purpose of the um, making um, inundation, flood inundation maps. I'm going to pass it back to okay. So taking the output um, from those hydraulic models, we will have information, uh, like Hossein said, uh, for each grid about uh, the water depth and the velocity of flow in each grid. And so what we want to do is, is take all the different ensembles that we've got now from these hydraulic models and, figure, and calculate uncertainty metrics for each of these grids. Um, and then we're hoping to take those uncertainty metrics that we calculate and visualize Google Maps. And when I talk about uncertainty metrics, uh, we've, we've settled on just doing it fairly simple in each grid, figuring out how many ensembles agree or what percent of ensembles agree um, with that measure, uh, with that metric in each grid. Uh, so here's a visual at the bottom to kind of demonstrate that. And this is a very rough, rough idea of what we're going to do in Google Maps Framework. It will look much better at the end. But in the top left, we have flood extent. And so flood extent is just saying, okay, what ensembles think that, or what ensembles solve that there will be flood in certain grids. And so our plan is to vectorize the median ensemble, so the 50 percentile. And that is the blue border you see there. And that gives you kind of the median flood. And then within that, you'll see there's darker shading. And that's because the ensembles, maybe 80, 90, 100 percent of ensembles agree that that area will see water. And then outside of that, it drops below 50 percent, so maybe only 10 or 20 percent of ensembles in certain grids outside of that blue line agree that there will be water there. And then when it comes to the other metrics we can measure, like water depth and flow velocity, that was more challenging because there's a lot of information there. And so we were thinking that we may be able to talk to some uh, decision makers and emergency managers and see what um, threshold they need for when making decisions on where to distribute resources. So for example, two feet of flooding may limit their ability to uh, get to some, uh, to some location. And so we could just say, okay, so for a water depth of two feet, uh, the ensembles are agreeing that certain grids will see this much, uh, will see up to two feet of a water depth. Same idea for flow velocity, but probably more important will be the last idea here, which is the critical condition. So combining flow, combining flow velocity and water depth. And the idea there is, is like, um, for example, if you have ankle high water and it's flowing at six, six or seven miles per hour, that could sweep someone off their feet. And so combining those metrics together, we could, in the end, provide uh, decision makers a visual that shows them our 50th percentile flooding, which is in the bottom right, that, um, that blue line. And then within that, overlaid will be the shading, which will show 
um, a percentage of what ensembles agree, for example, 100% in this middle where the dark shading is, 100%, so all the ensembles agree that you would see conditions with uh, two feet of water and over seven miles an hour flow velocity. Uh, and so, but to that, we're gonna be exploring a lot more possibilities for that. Now, uh, we, we thought this was a challenge, but now it sounds like it might be a great success. Uh, we were looking at our potential case study areas. Uh, we were looking at Darby Creek in Pennsylvania because we have a lot of great data there. Um, and it looks like now, um, from recent information we've acquired, that we will be able to look at Darby Creek. And so we were, we were kind of playing with looking at Guadalupe River uh, near Seguin, Texas. But uh, I think we'll be able to do Darby Creek, so we can skip this slide here, but we're a bit worried about that. And just go to our project timeline here. And so this kind of lays it out for you. Stage one, we're hoping to have that done by June 25th. And in tandem, we'll be working on stages two, three, and four across that time period. But those will take a little bit longer. So stage two and three, we hope to have done by July 9th. And then stage four, we hope to have knocked out by uh, July 15th, which gives us good time to prepare and disseminate the deliverables. And with that, we'll wrap up and take any questions. Excellent. So any other questions? What are you going to use for the observed uh, to compute the, the metrics for the flood inundation? Sorry, what would we, what would we be using? What for for the observed um, flood inundation? The observed inundation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so like we can use NLDES or MP uh, and simulate it probably. But so uh, we can use a model and use like NLDS precipitation or MPE, multi-sensor precipitation estimates, and really force it and get an extent of uh, observation, observed flood inundation. And that again becomes a simulated inundation, right? Yeah, that's the best we have. I mean, <laughs> we don't have any observation in each sure. degree. So. Any question? I have one question. So assuming that you have, you your model is uncalibrated, just assuming. So how do you differentiate between parameter uncertainty and ensemble uncertainty? Because the uncertainty that you showed, it's coming from the weather input, not from the model. No, we're going to use national weather model outputs. So we're going to use time-lagged uh, forecast. So that's like a different from different initialization time. So we have four different ensemble each day. So that's that it becomes four ensemble. So we are not going to play with the model. So we are just use the output from national weather model and analyze the uncertainty in the stream flow forecast. So we are not going to divide. Uh, meteorological uncertainty or hydrological uncertainty. Okay. So it's, so it's like total thing. uncertainty. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so if no question, then we can move to the next one. Okay, okay so densified measurement and uh, Combined Densified Measurement and Flood Inundation Mapping Group by Jackie, Yufen, and Dinu. Uh, hello, everyone. So flood inundation mapping again, but uh, we will do the comparison between different modeling approaches and aerial imagery. So we all know the importance of flood inundation mapping. And based on what we have learned these days, and our previous research experience, our objectives are using hand method and 2D hydraulic modeling, which is IRIC, and com to compare with um, satellite imagery to um, add our observation to compare for the flood extent. And this is our proposed work plan. And the first step is data acquisition. In this step, we are going to um, collect all the flow lines and rating curves, also some field survey data and USGS data and also satellite imagery. 
And then we are going to use hand and eye rake modeling to generate flood extent. Thirdly, we are going to use remote sensing as our observation for available flood events to compare with the modeling results. And the last step is comparison and analysis. So for the hand method, because we already have the 10 meter resolution for the whole um, continental US, so our procedure for this part is obtain stream flow data and translate it into water depth to generate the flood extent. Then Ethan will introduce the IRIC modeling and last Danuk will talk about something about remote sensing. Um, IRIC is a river flow and um, river blade um, variation. A different model, and I'm going to use FastMag and NAS 2D flood. I'm going to use FastMag to get the flow and the river bed information, and by doing doing um, sensitive tests to get the roughness because we need roughness for the um, NAS 2D flood. And for the data, um, we need um, geographic data, hydraulic data which is water elevation, and the major data background image. And then we can get the roughness, the best uh, idea roughness for the river bed, and then add um, inflow discharge and topography data to um, use next to d flood to make the inundation mapping. Right, so all what I have to say about remote sensing, uh, Krishna and Yan, they explained uh, the satellites available, um, the resolutions, the temporal spatial resolutions available, everything. So um, what we are basically trying to do is to validate the floods um, generated by uh, the hydraulic models. Uh, the, the special part here is that we'll be using the Google Earth Engine to uh, manipulate data and process data, which is, uh, the Google Earth Engine is a, a very popular platform to uh, manipulate uh, large chunks of data. Uh, the end result is going to be a tool. Uh, if, I, if I put this in uh, simpler terms, if you draw a polygon on Google Earth um, Engine uh, on anywhere on the mainland US, you should be able to get uh, floods which occurred um, between specified dates as outputs. So that's our end goal, right? So we'll be using this as a case study, and our end goal is that. So. Um, Currently, uh, we are working with uh, Dr. Cohen, Dr. P, and the USGS um, people. Uh, we are looking at uh, the Sendrain uh, flood in Colorado, Black Body in Alabama, and floods in Texas. We're still going through the remote sensing imagery, so we haven't zeroed in on um, which flood that we are going to uh, uh, create. But uh, I think we will stick to the Sendrain um, uh, flood. Yeah. So this is a timeline. We are in the process of uh, data acquisition, and uh, then will come the hand and IRIC modeling, then the remote sensing, um, the validation of the thing, the validation of the product, and at last, comparison and analysis. Yes. Any questions? Question. Uh, so just like I said, the, I told the other or asked the other group, you need, you need a matrix to quantify the comparison, right, to know what's, what's really works better or not. Um, also, um, for, the Earth, uh, for the Google Earth Engine, uh, as we get into learn, that's a really powerful remote sensing product. I'm not sure it will be ideal to do the visualization of the flood classification, maybe. I mean, I'll be happy to be proven that. But it, the, the disadvantage of it is compared to like uh, Google uh, Earth or Google Map, that it's not really open to, the, to everyone. Uh, yes, so um, about Google Earth Engine, it's not an open source software, it's proprietary. So um, uh, we are working on it, maybe. Um, it, is, it is open, it, but. It's open, but yeah, you need, um, you need to sign up beforehand. So 
yeah, we're working on it, so maybe. Yeah, maybe just uh, link in that to Google Earth, um, just so you everyone can visualize that. Yes, yes. Jim has a question? Just a comment. Oh. So, so as part of the snow work that I did, we... Well, he's he's the expert here on the Google Earth Engine. <laughs> uh, Google Earth Engine does plug into Google Apps, and Google Apps is open source. So if you look at, right. for example, the, the Hanson tree cover, that's calling Google Earth behind the scenes. So you don't, that's open, you don't need to sign up for it. All right. It's a little harder to implement, but it might be possible. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Okay, so let's have a big hand for Jackie, Yupeng, and Dinuk. Okay, Christian, Savannah, and Xing on hand visualization. Uh, so for our uh, project, we want to do a flood inundation map um, using the hand method and then using visualization through Tethys. Um, so our group is me, Christian Kessler, Savannah Keen, and Xing Shang. Um, that was right, right, Xing? <laughs> How do you say your last name? <laughs> Zheng. Sorry. Sorry. Xing Zheng. Um, so here's an example of a how hand works, it takes catchments and flow, mint, uh, flow lines as well as a DEM um, and it combines those. Then uh, hand stands for height above nearest drainage. Um, uh, so it takes the relative elevation um, and you can put in a height of 10 uh, meters for example and it will find everything below 10 meters and fill it with water. Um, so we're doing three separate projects sort of within hand. Um, Xing is doing one where instead of using DEM, he wants to use LiDAR data um, to make hand more accurate. Um, and he'll do a couple things with this, uh, with evaluating channel hydraulics and then uh, comparing them with a RAS model. Uh, the second project is a uh, sort of Tethys inundation map, uh, which will use hand to generate maps and then compare that versus uh, rating curves to find the depth um, in specific areas, and we'll use forecast data as well, um, and then compare that versus land use data to see where people are affected. Uh, so here's a little flow map of uh, what we'll do for this app is uh, we'll have a hand model, which will then, uh, on the top right, we'll have our flood map, which will output, and then we'll compare that with the land use uh, on the bottom. The red areas uh, on land use, that's where people are located. So we hope to have it, um, the flood change to red when people are impacted as opposed to uh, some of the green areas where it's just uh, uh, trees. And do we have a charger? <laughs> so the, uh, the third part of our project is another uh, inundation map. This one will be more of a dynamic map uh, which will use the current forecast and it'll be something similar to a, like a weatherman's forecast for a precipitation um, where you can scroll through a 15-hour forecast or 10-day forecast and uh, view where uh, the flood will be. Um, so here's just a, an example layout um, of a Tethys app that we could potentially do. Um, and this is for the Georgia area. Up top, you could select the catchment. Um, you can do your inputs for short, medium, or long range. Um, select your COM ID, and then at the bottom of the page, um, there's a scroll bar. You can scroll through back and forth, and the flood map will change as you move the scroll bar. Scroll bar. Scroll bar. Uh, so that's all we got for now. Thank you. Uh, questions? So this, this last project. Okay. Yeah, we hope to use the real forecast. Um, and then so for the short range, for example, it goes from zero to 15 hours. You can do a forecast for 
It'll show 15 forecasts as you slide the bar. Uh, yeah. And use precipitation, is that what you said? Um, no, we'll just use the National Water Model Forecast. Um, and there are rating curves that show uh, compare stream flow versus depth. And so we can use that um, with use the forecasted stream flow and compare it and get the depth and put it into the to the hand. Um, so there's the short range, which is a 15-hour one, and a medium, which is about 10 days. Um, and then there's a long range, long grade, long range one, which uh, we're still we're try trying to work on. But, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So our last speaker is from uh, Sanjib and Binching. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Sanjay Sarma from Penn State. Uh, I'm working with Bing Ching uh, on the project Real Time Post Processor towards improving flood inundation mapping. And we are working with Dr. Alfonso and Dr. Ibrahim. So, our objective uh, here is to develop or evaluate the potential of post processing uh, in improving the uh, flood inundation maps. So, what do we do here? The overall idea is uh, we take the uh, output from the forecasting system. Let's say we consider now like we are thinking for the national water model. We take the output from the national water model. Uh, then one of the scenario we do here is like create a flood in this map. So the overall idea here is to uh, implement the hydraulic and statistical model uh, to produce the unbiased, uh, reliable, and skillful stream flow forecast from uh, national uh, water model. So the hydraulic model actually we implement it for uh, for uh, propagating the prediction to the downstream and statistical model will improve the uh, error. So uh, in statistical model, uh, uh, we, we are thinking of using the first order autoregressive model uh, which, we implement, uh, which we implement as a post processor. Uh, then finally, uh, the post process stream flow here will be uh, verified against the uh, stage flow observation from densified network. So, for this for this project, uh, we we take uh, as a case study for Sera River Water State Iowa. The reason uh, one of the reason is it has a densified network for stage flow observation, and the second reason is uh, it has like uh, historical uh, flood events, sewer flood events. Um, so the ultimate goal here is to develop the flood inundation map. We will be developing here four different uh, flood inundation map. The first flood inundation map will be the will be from the observed from densified network. So if we go here, we will be developing a map uh, from the observed data from the stress flows observation from densified network. This is the first map. The second map we'll be developing here is from the raw stream flow forecast. So the second map will be the flood in the descent map, which we call the raw, which is from the national water model output. And the third model will be third uh, flood in the descent map will be the post process one. So the post process one is uh, so the post process one is we apply the post processor from the stream for the stream flow test uh, using using the first order autoregressive model and uh, we verify it against the identified network observation, and we will finally make a post-process flood inundation map. So, at, while looking at the post-process flood inundation map, we are still not sure like why, why, whether we need to post-process the stream flow and transform it to the uh, stage, or we need to transform stream flow to the stage at first, then post-process the stage and, uh, and map it. So we need to deal with the two different scenarios for the post-process one. So altogether, we'll be having four different maps. Uh, the overall goal, the ultimate goal here is to uh, encourage uh, the transform or the shift from uh, the 
developing a hydrograph or verification of hydrograph uh, to the flood maps, so which is ultimately a appealing uh, display for the communication. So the project timeline here is for the first week, we'll focus on data processing and developing the hydraulic modeling concepts. Second week, we will implement the post processor uh, and we'll be still working on the hydraulic modeling. For the third week, we will be working on the verification of the post processor and uh, we will develop some flood inundation map. And then finally, in the fourth week, we'll be done with all four maps. Yeah, that's all. Any, any questions? So are you going to have a specific case study? And also, are you, do you have any hydraulic model in mind? So right now, we are thinking about the hand model and the head press. So we need to figure out whether we are using both or one. What about a, do you have a case study in mind? Where to do it? So for the case study, we have like, uh, yeah. yeah, we have the Sarah River water set from Iowa. Can you talk a bit about your post processor? What does it do? So post processor here that we are going to apply is the first order autoregressive model, which is based on the uh, Markovian assumption. Simply Markovian assumption assumes that uh, the flow at this time step k plus one is dependent upon the uh, present time step, not dependent upon the precedent time step. So we'll be applying the first order autoregressive model uh, initially and and the next reason for applying the first auto autoregressive model is it is computationally efficient. So we want to look how it performs at first. Any other questions? So which lead time are you going to use for your real-time flood inundation mapping? So right now, we are not sure about the lead time, but we will be like focused on the medium range. So are you consider to um, use the short time range? Because we all know that the less time before the forecast, there will be more accurate. Yeah, that, that will be there. So short frames will be more effective, but we're thinking we'll not go for the long-term forecast. Maybe most provide the short or medium range. Okay, so I think this was our last group, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, from the audience, uh, uh, do you like to introduce yourself to the students, like from Jude and Dr. Meghna Barber Sibbins? Are you still online? Okay, Dr. Uh, Srivastava? Yeah, um, I enjoyed the presentation. Seems like uh, there are lots of uh, projects on flood inundation mapping, and only a few actually get to uh, evaluate the shortcomings of the national wa water model itself. So I look forward to seeing, you know, what the groups that are working on uh, shortcomings of the national water model come up with. Uh, Flood inundation mapping is not my area of research, so I'm uh, not as interested, but it seems like uh, there are lots of groups working on them and there would be some good products out. So overall, uh, I liked all the presentations and the enthusiasm of the students. Um, one thing I would like to uh, uh, see if you can send, me the, send us the slides so that we can look at them again, you know, to see yeah, what uh, the students are doing. Would you mind sharing the slides? Of course, we will share with you. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, do you want to talk? Well, we're, we're just very excited. It's just been two weeks and you've been uh, gone so far, so um, we are very glad. And Dr. Prasvik, do you want to say something? or? Yeah. I'm really 
Uh, I'm really excited also to see how quickly you've all come up with uh, really good project ideas in just two weeks. And I think uh, the challenge is going to be uh, just managing the time since we do have such a short time and you all have very ambitious projects. Um, but I'm confident that, you know, working together with your team leaders and your advisors back home that we'll be able to come up with some really good uh, outcomes by the end of the Summer Institute. Okay, so we have three other team leaders present here, and two of them will be leaving maybe tomorrow, but coming back. So we want to hear something from them? Yeah, I think uh, what Sarah said, Sam, the projects look great, and, and, and you know, I guess it's, it's just a question of I may narrowing down a little bit the project so that, you know, you have time to complete them in the four weeks, five weeks that you have here. Okay, so that was Dr. Alfonso Mejia from Penn State University. Uh, Dr. Albert Van Dyke from Australia. I heard some um, <clears throat> fantastic ideas this afternoon. Uh, the only advice I'd, I would give you is to, to remain flexible and don't be disappointed if you don't make it you know, right to the end of the ideas that you suggested because you won't. <laughs> 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 but so. So what that means is be flexible. You know, have a plan B, have a plan C, have a plan D, and be ready to adapt. And you know, the, the main thing is you've got so many great ideas that you will have something great at the end of this. I'm, I'm, I'm confident of that. So good luck to you all. So Dr. Ibrahim Demir from Iowa State University. University of Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I agree with all the other uh, team leaders, and they are all great projects. One suggestion I have is that maybe if we can have a mechanism for updating the team leaders, maybe a weekly progress update from each team to the relevant team leaders or maybe for the whole group, it will also show some ideas about how we are processing and how we are progressing into the development of all these projects and maybe give some ideas to other teams how fast they can move forward in the projects. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Saggy Cohen from University of Alabama. I think I said enough already, but um, I think we will have, right, weekly briefings? Yeah, weekly updates. Briefing. Yeah, weekly briefings every uh, Friday afternoon, 2.30 p.m. So there will be two forms of briefings each week. One is sort of informal to your team advisors and uh, whenever Professor Maidman is present. And the other one is more formal to the online audience and we expect more from the next week uh, where you present your weekly updates. Yeah, so we do have one last comment from uh, Dr. Baba Stevens. Uh, he said, a great project ideas. Looking forward to results. I encourage the teams to focus on the timelines and what possible in the time frame given. So um, just look at the schedule again. So we do have four weeks execution time, uh, time frame, and in the seventh week, there are some um, activities going on about extended abstract view and uh, a capstone event. So um, be flexible and uh, focus on, the, uh, be, be aware of the time frame. Okay, so I think we are done for today, and thanks for um, being present online. And we'll uh, send you the invitations for the next week's presentation. Um, so now I think we can just declare victory. <laughs>